Okay, let's welcome back to the Yaakov M Show, legendary Haredi journalist Yanki Farber, one of my favorite people on the planet, and uh, it's 1 a.m. here in New York, but at least Yanki, I believe, is well-rested, so that's good, that's something. Yanki, thank you very much for being here. Here's my question. Is the war progressing as the Israelis, as the government was hoping, or have they now been forced to go soft, to take a softer approach, a gentler approach, and that does that place soldiers in more danger? Well... There's so many reports about um, what you just said. And um, the IDF is is denying it completely. The IDF is saying that it's not true. And the reason why they're working uh, much more uh, um, carefully or different than in the beginning is because they want to make sure they don't uh, attack any place that the hostages might uh, be there. And the reason why they're changing the whole way of fighting is because most of Gaza is basically under the IDF. So there are a few places where IDF has not finished the, the job. Um, the soldiers must work much, much uh, different. Not, you know, like in the beginning, uh, shooting from, uh, you know, first from the air and then um, uh, tanks and then soldiers go in. Now, um, the places that are left over to check or much more uh, crowded with people and or completely different areas. So obviously they need to work differently. Again, there is, um, again, people say that uh, the IDF is working differently, but the IDF is denying it. Now, if it's true or not, I don't know. But um, obviously America is putting a lot of pressure on Israel, you know, to minimize the attacks that civilians could hurt. And this is not a secret. This has been it's been saying um, also in the United States and also in Israel. But I don't really think that the IDF is endangering uh, soldiers. They're just working different. People are used to that the IDF is going in with you know thousand soldiers at the first time at the beginning, but now they need to work different. I I don't think the IDF is endangering soldiers. Okay, interesting. And look, I trust your opinion a lot. And as you said, President Biden putting enormous pressure on Bibi Netanyahu. He criticized the indiscriminate bombing. Now there's a report that Biden hung up the phone on Bibi Netanyahu. They were the, having some kind of dispute about giving tax money to Palestinians. But obviously there's a lot of friction there. But, you know, number one, two questions. Number one, there's been an uptick. Uh, certainly more soldiers, every single life is precious and it's heartbreaking. But there there has been an uptick in the amount of soldiers dying. It used to be one or two a day. And now number three, five, more, more sometimes every day. And the Israeli media, you saw this reported a shift in the strategy. They're saying that now it's going to be more of a long-term war. They're saying that uh, they're not they're going to have a buffer zone. And they are saying that it's going to take maybe years to dismantle Hamas. So it does sound like there has been a change in the, in the strategy and the approach. Yeah, well, I know it sounds very, it's exactly what you said. At the end of the day, the people who are actually dealing with, with uh, the terrorists, with Hamas terrorists in Gaza, is not President Biden and not uh, Netanyahu and not even the chief of staff of the Israeli army. It's the soldiers in Gaza inside, and they actually um, um, work differently than before. And they many times I've heard, um, you know, some commanders, some even soldiers who went out from Gaza just for a few for a few hours to have a rest or something. They said, well. Everything is different than in the beginning, but not because what the media is saying. It's just, you know, at the end of the day, we saw yesterday, I think last night, that Amer Anthony Blinken, um, you know, skipped the Congress again, second time, and sold uh, some, uh, uh, quite a few, uh, some important things that the Israeli army needs. So, you know, also right. we have to remember that a lot of the things that Biden is saying and America is doing, and what is actually being done in Gaza are two different things because Biden must say some things for his people, like, you know, for many, many Palestinians who live in America and all the people who support him, they're very upset that he supports Israel so strongly. So he has to give them a little bit, you know, something to keep them quiet. So he's saying, yeah, we're doing this, we're doing that. I told Bibi this, I told Bibi that. At the end of the day, in Gaza, things are different. Oh, very, very, very different. And uh, on that note, you know, I do want to know if you know any details about the hostages. Look, as we know, Baruch Hashem, you know, many hostages were released. It's never enough, but, you know, many women and children were released. Uh, there are stories about hostages that are being found not alive. There are horrific stories. 
Uh, do you know any news? Obviously, the ones that were released were uh, under the control of Hamas. There are some rogue uh, people, captors, who are holding hostages who may never be found, Chas Shalom. But any news on, there are reports of negotiations, a possible ceasefire. I'm curious if you know any progress on that. And also, did Hamas gain anything? The last ceasefire was about two weeks. They released many hostages. Did Hamas gain anything by that? I'm curious why the Hamas would agree to another ceasefire. No, they, they, they keep saying all the time, we are not doing any ceasefire. We want the war to stop completely. And then we're going to start a negotiation about releasing hostages. Why? Because Hamas knows that if the war doesn't stop, they're all going to be finished. Uh, either way, Israel is going to kill them or they're just going to have to run away to Egypt or something like that. That's why they say that they're not going to do anything again. They're not going to do any ceasefire again. They, it, they demand the war to stop. Now, Israel is not going to do it. Yeah, that's for sure. Now, about the hostages, nobody really knows anything. But what we can say is, and it's been published, that from time to time, the IDF is publishing that another body, uh, another uh, hostages is definitely dead. Because um, for different reasons, maybe evidence, maybe, you know, Maybe the body was actually found, uh, but sometimes the reason why the IDF is not is not announcing officially about the body is because sometimes Rahman Litlon, the body is not in a position, you know, I mean there is not there is nothing much left. So right. that's why they're not making a big levy or anything like that. Sometimes the family is just they're just getting the information and this they just see so the reason why they publish it. Is because the family should be able to see Shiva, but I don't think there's anything left of quite a few wow. bodies. But again, this is something unconfirmed. This is something that people that people on the media speak about. Um, well, there is about more than a, there's about 129 host hostages that officially are still alive. Nobody really knows how many of them are really alive, and the and Hamas and Jihad. And some other, uh, and they keep saying, Hamas and Jihad keep saying all the time that the Israeli army killed um, its own hostages uh, by attacking um, this and th this and that. But, and the Israeli army, of course, is saying that um, it, it, we should not believe Hamas and Jihad uh, because they're just saying it, you know, to get a propaganda. Sure. But um, right. that's why we, we, we don't know. Nobody knows anything. Now, let me ask you a question because, as you just mentioned, we keep hearing about. Tragically, uh, you know, Rahman al hostages who are being discovered that are not alive. The, the judge last week, Judy Weinstein, I believe was her name. They said she, they confirmed she was actually deceased on October 7th and either the body was brought to Gaza or she was killed in Gaza. Her husband was murdered by Hamas. But a few weeks ago, six hostages were found. But there are certain cases where they were brought to Gaza alive. And then they were killed. And I know you're saying that Hamas claims and I don't believe it. The Hamas claims they were killed by Israeli airstrikes. But sometimes they're killed by Hamas, even though they were being held for many weeks. And do you have any idea how they're killed, why they were killed? Because they are alive. They survived the actual October 7th attack. So um, no, there are no details about that. So so there's two ways of trying to work it out. One way, some of those people did, did arrive to Gaza alive, but we don't know how, in what condition. Some of them were badly injured. Some of them came to Gaza, and because there is obviously no decent medical uh, uh, treatment in Gaza, so probably they died not because of Hamas. I mean, or because of Hamas, he, right. he, what they did, what they did on seventh of October, but um, they died just because there's no decent equi uh, yes, uh, medical equipment in Gaza. About and also, um, maybe they died also because they were killed on purpose by Hamas. Um, we don't know. The IDF is not announcing the reason why uh, the people were killed. Just, just saying that the, the that sometimes they say that um, those hostages died on seventh of October. So it means maybe they just took bodies. Hamas, you know, just took bodies to Gaza. We don't know. I, I don't think we will never know. We'll ever know. Interesting. It's possible they took the bodies there to make it seem like they yes. were holding more hostages well, than they really are. Well, listen, I don't think 
people watched all the videos that Hamas published on 7th of October. But some of the videos, you can see they're actually taking bodies, dead wow. bodies. on. So maybe those people uh, been brought to Gaza when they were dead. Maybe they died on the way. And maybe they died after a few days because there was no uh, medical treatment. Right. Now, let me ask you, uh, the two big Hamas leaders, Ismail Haniya, Khaled Mishal, they have been protected in Qatar for years and years. You know, they have been sheltered there. And Israel has basically known their location in addition to the United States. Now, I believe they're in Cairo. And uh, I would think that they're almost sitting ducks. Why has Israel not ever assassinated or have they even attempted to assassinate these two, Ismail Haniya, or Khaled Meshal, or even now, is that something that do you think they're trying to do, or is that not on the table? Well, I, I, I don't know to say, I don't have an, I really don't know, but what I can say is that I've heard many, uh, you know, Israeli um, senior, you know, some people that used to work for the Shabak, for the Mossad, maybe one of them is even the head of the Mossad, I don't remember his name, um, some of them said, you know, very high profile people said, that the reason why Israel is not uh, killing those people in, in Egypt or in Qatar, because Israel doesn't want to um, kill them in a different state that are friendly with Israel officially. Now, Egypt uh, is very much, is much more sensitive. If Israel is going to kill those people in Egypt, well, it could really uh, arm the Israeli-Egypt relationship. And this is something Israel does not want to do. About Qatar, Israel needs Qatar for now. So, but many Israeli, uh, you know, high-profile people say that straight after the war, Qatar is going to pay the price. And I believe that Israel can and will uh, kill those people um, in Qatar. And I don't think in Egypt, but in Qatar. Well, you know, those people go around all over. They go to Syria, they go to Iran, they go to Lebanon. They will get killed eventually. Why? that haven't been killed till now. This is one of those questions that we're going to need to ask. Um, you know, we have a lot of questions about 7th of October. So this is going to be another question. But at the moment, many Israeli officials say that the reason why those two people have not been killed in countries like Egypt and Qatar, because Israel needs those two countries for now. So they're not going to do anything in those two countries. Okay, and I suspect it's something like that, but I can understand a lot of people being very outraged by that because once you know that was before this attack but you know once this attack happens now you see the incredible danger that it created you know so uh is it really worth it i mean they need kata but like you know what i'm saying it's very very frustrating yeah but but you have to remember that, that if at the end of the day also you know israel needs a relationship with um jordan with egypt with um you know even qatar and the United Arab Emirates, he, he can't just go to another country and kill somebody um, and just say, it's not me or anything like that. So it's also a lot of things that are in the background and many, many um, coincidences, you know, and many, I don't know, you know, when if, if Israel will kill um, some Hamas guys in different countries, I, I, I think um, there will be a lot of uh, problems for Israel. So that's why Israel is waiting for a good opportunity to do it. And the head of the Shak said, we are going to kill all of them. It's going to take time. It's going to take a year, two, three, four, five, but they're all going to die. So I don't know, maybe Israel is just waiting for a better opportunity. Right. And let me ask you a question. And you do seem very positive. I mean, you're very measured and calculated. And I think everything you're saying has a lot of substance as always, and you're very well informed. Um, do you still believe uh, you know, Hamas will be dismantled uh, now that they're talking about winding it down to a longer term? It's, to me, it's starting, starting to sound a little bit like the United States and Afghanistan after 9-11. Well, we're shifting strategy. We're going to wear down Hamas. In other words, there used to be the airstrikes. They were pummeling. They were bombing them, carpet bombing. And now it feels like, well, they're going to wear them down. There's so many of them. It's going to take a long time. Number one, how long will it take? And is it going to happen? Or, or is there going to be a point where they just say, you know, they occupy, but they can't really uh, just completely destroy it. Well, you know, this Hamas is a big problem because it's not destroying the people of Hamas. Hamas is, you know, is is ideological. They, it's like, uh, 
It's idea. Hamas is idea. It's not right. some people. Okay, so you're going to kill all Hamas people in Gaza. They still have people who support them around the world. And in Lebanon, in Syria, in Egypt, in Qatar, whatever. So, sure. you know, killing uh, the idea of Hamas, I don't think it's possible. But definitely Israel is going to make sure. With all the pressure Israel has from America, from or, or from other countries, Israel will do everything to destroy Hamas. And you know what? Um, Sinwar and all those people, they, they will never see the daylight again. They're going to stay in bunkers, just like Nasrallah in Lebanon. The second they will show up, they're going to die because Israel is, doesn't have much to lose anymore. I mean, you know, right. you can you, we can see that Hamas is not shooting many rockets like they used to in the beginning of the war. If you remember, not 7th of October, even after that, if you see now, we have days Great that they haven't, been, they haven't been shooting even one. So you can see that the power, of course, it's been uh, much less and they're much weaker. And, mo- and a, lot of those, a lot of their leaders are dead. And Israel Netanyahu said last night that 8,000 8, uh, Hamas members are dead. And Israel captured another about another 2,000 that were in Israel. So you can see that Israel is doing it. Yeah, it's going to take time. And again, it's all the matters of the, of America, how much time America is going to give Israel. You know, Biden has an election very soon, and he wants the war to be over long time before the war, long time before the election, so he should not damage him. But uh, so at the end of the day, Israel doesn't really care about it because, you know, for Israel, whoever wins, it's good. Biden, Trump, yeah. I don't know what's going to, I don't know what's going to happen, but you know, even Nikki Ailey or, or whatever it is, for Israel, it doesn't really matter. That's why Israel doesn't really care about America. But yes, Netanyahu and Gallant, you know, the, the defense minister, when they speak to the Americans, you know, if it's Biden, if it's Blinken, if it's, um, you know, whatever, they need to... Israel is, does respect a lot of America. And when they come with demands, when they come with... Um, and when they ask questions, of course, you know, they, they, they all, Israel is very um, concerned about everything that America is saying. Well, maybe they don't agree with them and maybe they do different, but Israel is not just saying, yeah, we don't care what America is saying. Yeah, Israel does care about what America is saying, and it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or Democrat at the end of the day. Sure, understood. Uh, now, I've got to ask you something I've been struggling with for quite a long time. As time goes on, there are more reports exposing the intelligence failures, the intel that they did have before October 7th. And I understand why they didn't take it seriously. But now there are reports that the Israeli intel, they knew about these drills, massive drills, hundreds or maybe thousands of Hamas uh, soldiers who were training. There were exercises right across the border on the other side. Hamas was posting videos of these uh, fake attacks, mock attacks, practice drill attacks. And now they're saying a Shin Bet informant was warned, uh, uh, actually warned the Shin Bet of an attack uh, right after Yom Kippur, even gave a time frame which was accurate. And, you know, you, you really wonder, you know, how much more is there going to be discovered before people start to lose faith in the government? I know they're saying, listen, not during a time of war. We have to wait until it's over. But, you know, really nobody, not one person has been held accountable. Not one person has been fired or reprimanded over this. And and there are still mistakes that are happening now, although Baruch Hashem, things are going pretty well. So what's the reaction to that? How should we feel about that? Well, I don't know if you if you did, uh, but yesterday the New York Times posted um, a long, long report about how Israel reacted on 7th of October. And what oh, you're talking... Okay, I'll check that okay, out. Okay, yeah. so you should check it out. So what you just said was before 7th of October. Now, the New York Times posted about what happened on the day of the 7th of October, that the Israeli army wasn't ready for something like that. So on 7th of October... Was ready or was thousands... not? No, the Israeli army were not ready for it because they didn't believe... Now, the reason why the Israeli army were not ready for it because the Israeli army is not training for something that they don't believe it's going to happen. Right. This is what the New York Times... This is like the, you know, the headline. The bottom and whatever you want to call it. Israeli army never trained about something like that because they never believed that this would happen. And on 7th of October, on Simcha's story morning, thousands of soldiers were on their way to the south. They could not reach the bases. They could not reach 
um, the villages, they could not reach Kfar Gaza, they could not reach, you know, Kibbutz Beheri, because Hamas took over all streets in the south. This is something that Israel has never, ever, ever thought about. And it took time first to kill them. And so many soldiers went down with just a pistol, you know, or maybe M16, but not with proper weapon like Hamas had. Wow. So that's why it took that's why it took a long time. And that's also why it took five, six hours because they shut down the whole streets, the whole unbelievable. Yes. Now, more than that, the helicopter uh, pilots got it. They, did, they didn't know where to attack. So this is the New York Times. They reported yesterday. So they got information from WhatsApp. Telegram, Instagram, YouTube, you know, they've been told by the commanders, watch channel 11, 12, 13, see where people need help and go shoot them. You know, you, you get it? So it was not just, wow. yeah, you should read the New York Times and you should post it on your website, of course. Sure. It's really, it's really, really crazy story. It's a long, long report. I read the whole thing yesterday. I, of course, I translate you know, the important things on Hebrew for our readers. Uh, but uh, this is really crazy. So if you put together what you said just before, about before 7th of October, and what happened on 7th of October, all together was going to be really investigated like crazy. And everybody is going to go home, even he doesn't like it, from Netanyahu till all the way down, and also in Israel, or also the Israeli army. Chief of staff and all the rest, they're all going to go home. I mean, they're all going to be fired, they're going to resign, whatever. And also, the Israeli intelligence, they all failed. Now, why they failed is because what I think, from my point of view, I, I don't, I'm not a, you know, an expert in military, but what I think is that the, they just didn't believe that uh, Hamas is so strong. And even what he said, they saw the videos and, um, and the training and They've been told, they've been informed by soldiers that, by, you know, female soldiers, that yeah. some, most of them were captured and killed. They didn't believe, you know, when I was in the IDF, yeah. many times I came to um, my commanders and I said to them, well, I saw this, I saw that. So they told me, nah, it's, it's nothing. So once or twice, I said to myself, well, he's, he, he doesn't care, he's too tired. Well, I'm going to skip him, and I'm going to skip somebody higher than him. And when I did that, I was told that if I do it once more, I'll go to jail for skipping a, 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 a for commander and going to hire. Wow. Yes. Wow. We're not allowed, in the Israeli army, you're not allowed to do it. You're not allowed to go to a higher commander unless you had permission from your own commander. So, but I was a chutzpeniak. And I didn't care so much. <laughs> so I'll tell you what I did. I called up um, a very, very famous Israeli journalist, um, an IDF journalist. I can say the name. She's still working, actually. She's, she's amazing. Uh, her name is Carmela Menashe. She's a very well-known Israeli uh, IDF um, journalist, Carmela Menashe. And I told her what I thought, what I, thought, what I think. And she said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And it's been sorted. And, and they didn't, of course, the IDF didn't know that I sent it to uh, this lady. I waited a few days. It shouldn't be too close. So, right. and and those soldiers on the Israeli, on Israel-Gaza border told the commanders, Hamas is training like crazy. We see it. This is something we've never seen before. And they all told them, you're talking nonsense. It's impossible. And it's not true. So, and you know, even the head of the intelligent um, uh, of the intelligent, his name is Khaliva. Uh, he got the information. He said, "Nah, it's nothing. It's nothing. No, not to be worried." They did not believe that Hamas can do something. I don't know if it's Koichi or it's Yudi. I don't think so because Israel has been attacked so many times. Right. Um, so I don't think there was something like being, That's you know, being Hamas a guy. Them. Hamas, but they spent years, years tricking them. They deceived them. <laughs> Yes, they they met, they did many tricks that Israel should not realize that what yeah. Hamas is preparing. So I don't think it was Koichi Voitzem Yodi. I, I just think that it's at the end of the day, Hashem. It just blinded our leaders. It blinded our intelligence. And this is what happened. 
That's why I'm saying that all of them need to go. All of them need to resign because we need to have new people who think differently and also listen to, um, you know, uh, soldiers who are not high commanders. And if a soldier that it's only been in the army for a year is telling his commander, well, listen, I see something. Don't ignore it. You know, listen to it. Check it out. Listen to and the people on the ground. On the ground. Yeah. What bothers me, you say they have to go and they have to resign, is that they're saying after the war, after the war, not until after the war, and that gives them incentive to prolong the war as long as possible. People are not going to like to hear that, but that's what bothers me, is Netanyahu could keep this war going for a year or two. No, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. It's not true. Yeah. Once the missions are going to be, once the missions in Gaza are going to be finished, Benny Gantz is going to leave the government. So then you know the war is over. Gantz is not going to stay uh, for forever in, in in such a government if there is no need. Gantz is not stupid. The second Gantz will realize That's that the missions point. are over, the unity he's going to leave. And, Great point. Yes. So so then then we'll, and I'll tell you more. The day after the the war, Netanyahu is going to announce. This is what this is my opinion, and this is what I've heard. Uh, he's going to announce. A election in three months' time, because three months is like the minimum time you need to prepare election. Right. So he's going to do it because if he's not going to do it, you know, maybe I don't know if all Israel, but at least fifty percent or sixty percent of the people in Israel will go on the streets and will demand Netanyahu's resigning because all of them failed, and he doesn't realize maybe Netanyahu, but this is going to be the bigger demonstration, and not just the left are going to demand Netanyahu's resigning. Also, many, many right-wing people will demand because all those people from Netanyahu till the bottom and the IDF, all top commanders, they almost resigned. They failed. They haven't done the job. And all those people who died, um, you know, the civilians who died on 7th of October, this is their fault. And they also said it. They said it many times that the second the war is going to be over, they're going to do their steps and they failed, they admitted it. Netanyahu was the only one that um, didn't really say that was his fault. He just said that he's going to check, uh, he's, he's going to check everything after the war. But at the end of the day, Netanyahu, you know, he, he did a lot of great things. Oh, but yeah. he's been prime minister, but, but he's been prime minister for 15, 20 years. Yeah. And, you know, it's impossible to say, well, it wasn't my fault. I'm just new in the job. No, no you're not new in the no. job. You've been you've been doing it for the last 15 years. And if this happened, it's your fault. You can blame the intelligent. You can blame the IDF. You can blame everyone. But you know something? If Netanyahu would be a manager of a private company, he would be fired on 7th of October in the exactly. morning. Exactly. You you get credit for all the good, and there was much good. You have to take the blame. If you want to don't, take no yeah, credit for this, take away all the credit for the good. It, you, it goes yeah, you, you can't just take credit for the good. You have to also take yeah. responsibility for the bad. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I agree with you 100%. We're going to leave it on that point. Yeah, Yankee, we love you. We love you, and you're brilliant, and <laughs> Thank you're you. great, you're honest, and you're a chutzpah young, so we like that too, but I don't think so. I, I You're amazing, and people are giving me good feedback. They love hearing from you. I, I, thank you so much for everyone. I, actually, I, I did many uh, things that I shouldn't have done in the Israeli army. because <laughs> No, because I, I, I realized that nobody's listening. So we did, we, we used to pass the information to the journalists and they used to post it. Interesting. All right. That's the next episode. Then we're going to talk about all of that next time we interview you. No problem. That's, that's a beautiful. Yeah, I have some good story. I have some good stories for you. Okay, good to know. Okay, thank you very, very much. And you're very valuable to the entire Korean community more than anybody realizes. We'll leave it there. Yaki Thank you. Barber, Haredi journalist and a wonderful, wonderful friend on the Vin podcast and the Yakovim show.